I don't control that anymore. Welcome everybody. We still have two minutes left. If you would like to uh, type in the chat box where you are located, that would be greatly appreciated. Idaho, wow. Pennsylvania, Virginia. Getting quite a few from West Vancouver. Is that Vancouver, Washington or Van Vancouver, Canada? Turkey. Georgia, Canada. Okay. I'm from Vancouver, Canada. I haven't been there for many years, but went to the University of British Columbia. We've got one more minute. If you haven't done so, please put uh, where you're at in the chat box. It will help a bit. So we got Idaho, Pennsylvania, Virginia, Vancouver, Canada, Turkey, Northwest Georgia. So quite a few interesting places. Oh, hope you put your name. You're from Lancaster, Pennsylvania. I didn't realize it was you. Israel. Wow, we haven't had anybody from Israel. Okay, East Tennessee. I have three o'clock, so we are going to get started. Uh, we are being recorded, and this recording will be available uh, online on our YouTube channel. It will also be posted on the Facebook page, and it will also be uh, posted where you um, click to register. Uh, my name is Dr. Jackie Jacob, and I am the poultry specialist here at the University of Kentucky. And uh, part of my work is to coordinate the small and backyard flocks community of practice with eExtension, which is the electronic version of the National Cooperative Extension Service. And as part of the uh, program, we run monthly webinars. Um, this week is going to be a, sort of a double webinar. The one that is coming on today will um, also be in Spanish on Thursday. Um, so if you want to watch the Spanish version, uh, it, it will be the same material, just given in Spanish. Um, and uh, it uh, is the same time, but on Thursday. Um, Hope Kasip, who's one of our uh, panelists today, will be helping with that Thursday one because my Spanish is really bad. Hers is a bit better. Um, so during the webinar, I will be on mute and um, my video will be turned off. If you have a question, if you're like me, you're likely to forget it um, before, you know, if you don't put it down right away feel free to put it in the Q&A box or in the uh, chat box. And um, I will, if I'll be monitoring both and if the question is a clarification of something that's being talked about, I will um, turn my, my camera and microphone on and ask for the clarification. Otherwise we will hold the questions to the end, but feel free to type them at any time. And uh, unless it's a clarification of something he's talking about at that time, it will uh, wait till the end. And today we have a speaker from Florida. Uh, how, how do you say your name? Janelle Bos Mendes? Yeah, Boskis, yeah. Jonah, Boskis. for you. Yeah. Jonah, okay. You don't say the L on the end? Well, it's the Americanized version of it. 
Uh, okay. Uh, from uh, Florida Extension, and he's a ag agent there with uh, a lot of work with poultry. And um, he will be talking about Poultry 101. So it's all yours, Jonah, and I will be on mute. Thank you. Let's see if I can put this thing to work. Can everybody see my screen? Yes, it's working. Awesome. Okay. Again, my name is Jonah Bosques. Um, I've been with Extension for about 15 years. Uh, I am an animal scientist. I don't have a poultry major per se, but I do have a lot of experience. One of my uh, earliest experiences that I can actually remember was getting uh, attacked by a chicken when I was trying to get a, a, a little chick from her. So. <laughs> I that's one thing that I that I'll never forget. Um I am very curious by nature. Um and I just was uh, I fell in love with uh, animal science, so I got my bachelor's and masters and uh a lot more life experience by being an extension agent and uh helping out folks in diseases and in nutrition and poultry exhibition etc. So I've been around the block a little bit. Uh, a lot of the things that I've done are tied to small farms uh, and urban farming. Uh, so backyard poultry are are uh, sometimes uh, a lot of a lot of the demand is is there and not a whole lot of the expertise, at least in Florida. So here I am. The other compounding issue is that our uh, state is growing in numbers when it comes to Hispanic population. And um, a lot of the Hispanic cultures out there, uh, they they want to have backyard chickens for the eggs and um, other things. So I develop material for uh, Spanish speakers as well using university resources. Anyway, so that's kind of my background and uh, uh, let's uh, go in depth on the presentation, hopefully. Uh, if you have any questions, type them in the chat box and uh, and hopefully we can answer them as, as they arise. So my, my topics are subdivided basically on logical order, chronological order based on what I would be experiencing when I am um, uh, starting a chicken uh, venture on my backyard. So... First thing that people want is a fluffy chick, but you know there's a lot of breeds and that there's a lot of purposes. So we want to talk about the different breeds that we can uh, that we can select from. Certainly, uh, my inventory on breeds is very limited. There's a lot more um, that you can select, and each year when you go to the uh, catalog or when you go to the hardware store, there's a lot more breeds or lines that they try to sell you, uh, which are, you know, we, it makes everything more complicated. We're, you know, right after we, we commit the, uh, the act of buying, uh, our chicks, what do we need to be doing, um, to keep them alive and healthy? So that's my second objective to talk about husbandry practices. And then, uh, the third topic is going to be objective is going to be the physiology of that laying hen and, you know, what's in on the undercarriage and how do I take care of that hen? Uh, so she lasts me, uh, a long time. So on the background, let's start talking about, you know, chickens, you know, if, if, uh, if you go to the Bible, you know, the chickens are there because, we, um, this is one of the oldest domesticated uh, animals that, that we have, and it is not the oldest, um, but because of the uh, trade routes, uh, there was a lot of uh, influx of, of poultry around the, uh, around the world, especially going through the Middle East where we have the oldest records uh, of, you know, humanity. That's where you see, um, that they migrated eventually to Europe and Africa, and uh, they came to to the Americas uh, 
you know, when they settled, well, the Europeans settled America as well. So they're all over the, the world, I guess, right now. Um, but they did originate in Southeast uh, Asia, uh, where they have uh, the red jungle fowl. And uh, from there, we domesticated this animal that has a high potential for breeding and production. And that's how we came up with the chicken breeds that we have uh, today. So there's a lot of different uh, breeds to choose from and based on your needs, based on what you uh, are, are desiring, you can choose what breed you want based on size, on production, if you want an exhibition bird, if you're in another country where you can, uh, where you're allowed to uh, have game birds for sport, you, there's there are birds for that. There are lines for that. It is not legal in the United States to do that, um, but we do have exhibition birds um, of the same lines, basically. So, based on my experience, poultry can bring a lot of um, entertainment to our our lives, basically. Um, when you have little kids, I involve mine, but they can also supply you with a lot of headaches. Um, so we have to plan accordingly. We have to look at not just uh, having a bird in our backyard that can poop our breakfast, but also how to keep that bird from invading other spaces that we don't want that bird to be uh, going into or causing trouble with the neighbors, etc. So yes, Chickens can be awesome, but um, if you read my sarcasm, they can also be awesome. So think about how you know we take care of them and how uh, we prepare for for them. If you don't have them um, in in your uh, and you're just planning uh, at this point. So in the U.S., we have highly organized uh, areas. Or, suburban areas where you have homeowners association uh, uh, restrictions. And uh, if I am going to uh, purchase a bird and I live in these restricted communities, I have to read the fine prints and uh, understand what my limits are. Every city, at least in Florida, has a different code uh, for birds. So there's some different legislation law, uh, laws in place that limits the amount of animals you can have per household, per acre, etc. So researching is extremely important. Look at the uh, at what rights you have as a homeowner and understand that your neighbor has the same rights as you do. So when you are gearing up to having some animals in your place, just talk to your neighbors and probably bribe them with some future eggs that you're going to share with them. So uh, when that rooster is crowing for the first time, they don't get alarmed and call the, uh, you know, the, the code enforcement on you, which happens uh, a lot in, in a lot of these suburban places. So think about uh, what your, uh, how you're gonna mitigate some of the effects of having animals. People think that chickens attract uh, uh, mice and snakes and uh, and uh, wild animals. Um, so cleanliness is important. Have a plan. Have a a you know couple of designs that you look at before you purchase your animals. This is important, especially if you're surrounded by people like uh, we are here in Florida. So depending on what you want and uh, the allowance of uh, animals that, that, that you can have on your property, you can have animals that are going to be uh, for meat consumption, uh, for eggs, exhibition. You have some animals that are going to be uh, both for that you can harvest and eat as well as they lay eggs. Uh, so think about those. You can go with ducks and geese, quail, which are extremely prolific and uh, productive, and they don't take up a whole lot of space, but they, again, are extremely prolific, so they will reproduce and um, they need special care. 
uh, exotic animals uh, usually are not allowed in in urban or suburban areas. So look at um, your ordinances if you reside in in the in the countryside or in an agricultural zone. Then you can certainly go with peafowl, with guinea hens, with pheasants. We have some guinea hens in the office uh, because we are in a in a very rural area. Uh, we have some laying hens as well here. Uh, the guinea hens are extremely loud, and they discourage a lot of the predators, but they still can be uh, attacked at night. So they're not they're not guard animals uh, just because they sleep at night. Course. So you can have some predation that way. Um, so you have to take other other measures uh, to to manage that. So um, these are some options that are very common in 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 Florida. You know, feed stores. You can find these uh, during chick days, which are that that uh, segment of time uh, that. Uh, feed stores market uh, some of these animals to homeowners. They call them chick days because they have live chicks in the stores. And a lot of the high demands uh, breeds are going to be the Buff Orpingtons, the Bard Rocks, the Rhode Island Reds, Araucanas or Americanas that are the uh, the uh, blue egg layers or the Easter eggers. Um, again, there's, uh, there's many lines a lot of them are going to be sex linked. So you can look at them when they're a day old chick and you can separate the, the boys from the girls. Um, some breeds are not going to be sex linked. So you will not be able to look at them without studying them thoroughly if they're going to be a, a, a become a rooster or a hen. So those things you have to keep in mind. Meat breeds include the Cornish Cross, the Red Rangers, the barred rocks are the parental lines for uh, some of these uh, two. Um, also the Jersey Giants, there are, the Jersey Giants are going to be this breed that, that'll grow to a bigger animal, but they are going to be slower growing and slower in development as, as, the, as the Cornish Cross and the Red Ranger. So again, consider what, resources you have. Anytime that I talk to a producer of, you know, vegetables or a uh, homeowner, look at your resources. What, uh, what do you have? What, you know, how much money you want to spend on what you don't have. Um, so the space is extremely important. A lot of the um, issues that we encounter with poultry production is this craze of just not not just buying a couple of chicks, but buying, a, you know, it's like a shopping spree. People go crazy and they want to go and buy more. Um, and then you get, get into this hoarding situation. So think about how much you actually need, how many animals you actually need. If your purpose is to get eggs, um, you want to, you, and your family full of four, then how many eggs Am I going to be receiving, you know, several months down the road and uh, for how long? So you have to do this planning ahead of time. Usually in Florida, uh, where local organ ordinances here at least will allow you six hens per uh, uh, residential lot. Um, and, uh, you know, if you go if you if you start producing if if those hens start producing at the same time uh you're going to have half a dozen eggs at their peak um a day are you going to consume all of those eggs what are you going to do so um just food for thought when you're planning um your your venture think about price what what are the the cheaper options and how long will it take me to get to the production stage and how much money do I have to spend on this? This is very important when you're looking at an animal project for 4-H and uh, you're buying one of these pricey animals uh, versus having an animal that is of the same breed but not the same line and uh, which is going to be your utility animal. Um, 
think about how much you're willing to pay for for this uh this chick or this uh hen or or you know whatever you're buying again you have to look at your neighbors and you have to consult with your neighbors uh is this going to be a problem if we have a rooster what are we going to do with it usually you cook the rooster but that's uh, some people have issues with that um and they want to rehome which was a new term for me uh that popped up in social media several years ago where people they give away this this rooster that they don't that they didn't think they would own and they're 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 causing trouble so think about about that and maybe going with uh a sex link breed instead of an exotic breed or something that you bought uh out of impulse so planning uh, it's important here re regardless of the size of the operation that you're that you're thinking about running if it's a backyard operation or if it's a, it's a commercial uh if it's a commercial then this class is not for you um so if you want to get in trouble with your neighbors you can buy a rooster go ahead if you want to uh live in peace like i do then i would make smart decisions based on the resources that that we have once we purchase the animals we want to have uh we want to be sure that this animal is going to survive we're not taking care of of a plastic plant we're taking care of a living organism so we want to protect that they old chick from the elements especially today which is uh cold here in the united states i know it's 67 degrees here where i am but where jackie is is probably a lot colder uh it's still windy and uh they old chicks don't have the capacity to maintain their bodily temperature so we have to supplement them with the uh protection from from the wind from drafts and then also with with lighting that or with heat uh and usually we use heat lamps for that so a brooder should have an adequate space for the amount of chicks that you have and uh remember that in a couple of weeks those chicks are going to start feathering and they're going to start jumping and flying so uh again plan accordingly um and plan ahead when you have them in your brooder you have to make sure that they are going to be happy and uh, the way that we do this is that we measure the temperature a ground level where the chicks are going to be about eight inches above the floor is where you want to have that 100 watt light bulb um, depending on the conditions of uh, uh, where you're keeping them if you're keeping them indoors and uh, your heat is cranked up to 78 degrees um, with this measurement you're probably going to cook your chicks so the good distribution um, uh, needs to be observed where the animals are distributed all over the, the brooder, not huddled together or uh, in a corner away from the from the heat source. So um, that's something that, that we need to keep in mind. If you have a thermometer, you can use a thermometer and keep in mind as well that they are going to grow out of the stage and as they grow taller, that heat, that temperature is going to change. So you're going to have to raise that, that heat lamp as well. It's all about observation and trial and error. Um, when they are fully feathered, three weeks, three and a half, four weeks old, um, then they can be taken out of the, you know, you can turn off the heat source and uh, they should be able to maintain that that temperature if it's extremely cold outside it, it's not a good idea to put them outside yet um but in a room temperature of 75 70 degrees they should be fine um they are going to be small and uh if you have other chickens they are going to be targets for cur excessive curiosity so uh, you should not commingle 
uh, new uh, babies or bitties with older animals because they're going to get uh, picked on. They're going to get abused because, you know, that is the pecking order. So think about uh, having them on a place where they have access to the rest of the colony, but don't have contact with the rest of the colony just yet. So they can eat and drink uh, and, uh, you know, don't have to waste time defending themselves or running away or get injured. Water is important and uh, having them, uh, having a, a good source of water, uh, it, it's, it's a lot simpler than what we think if we have the right conditions. If you are in Alaska right now or Canada, where I know that some people are, are tuning us from, that water needs to be available even in the winter time, even if they don't drink, especially when you look at the uh, first stages, uh, stages of life and you have them in this brooder where you know there's a heat source but, so they're evaporating or they're transpiring sorry um vapor water vapor through their you know body so that water needs to be replaced when you when you have a day old chick they may not know how to drink water just yet so what you can do is that you can put a water with marbles of different colors uh so they start pecking at the different colors and shapes and that way they train themselves on how to drink uh, water. There's different kinds of waterers out there. Some are good, some are not so good. I like to uh, DIY my things, I invent and solve problems. Uh, so, you know, uh, something as simple as a Coke bottle can, can do for now. But I have to remember that uh, excess light hitting that water is going to create algae and bacteria, especially if the chick is eating and then drinking water and transferring some of the nutrients from, from the feed to the water source. And uh, when you do that, then you're creating a perfect environment for bacteria and fungi and diseases to start uh, you know, uh, spreading. So cleanliness is important. Um, a good water is one that you don't have to clean that often um, and has minimal um, exposure. Um, so maybe a nipple uh, water would be best as the chicks grow older and you train them, um, you know, of course, to drink out of those nipples because it's not going to be natural to them. Uh, if you look at this bell water in the in the bottom here, it's gonna have a flat top. As the chicks grow older, they're going to start flying and per trying to perch. And the first place that they're going to start perching is gonna be on top of that bell water. What happens when they perch for a long time? They, they wanna go to the bathroom. And where do they go to the bathroom? In the water source. So keep that in mind. And uh, again, troubleshoot. So feeding, uh, it will depend on the age of your animals. Of course, we start with a starter feed, which is going to have a lot higher protein than uh, your uh, layer feed, less minerals, less calcium. From day old to eight weeks, when they start laying eggs, uh, you wanna have a starter grower mix. Um, and then when they start laying eggs, then uh, you want to switch to a developer feed that has a lower protein content and then um, a higher mineral content uh, to help with the replacement of that calcium carbonate that they are, they're using for, uh, for the egg production. If you are doing broilers and uh, you're harvesting them, uh, you know, during that first uh, 15 weeks, then you don't have to, you know, switch. And, you know, that helps with, you know, just sticking with a grower feed. All righty. So um, 
chicken scratch and uh, food waste can be fun to feed, but sometimes can mess with their uh, metabolic system. So uh, I would advise you to stay away from feeding a lot of a lot of you know extra stuff and, and snacks. There's these mealy worms that that people buy and other other snacks for for chickens. Um, try to stay away from them because they're not producing a lot of benefit usually. Um, so if you have a formulation that is specifically uh, made for the age group of of your colony, then I will stick with that. They can go out and forage, and uh, uh, you know it's been written that when they forage, they supplement their diet up to thirteen percent. Uh, so some studies, um, but I wouldn't eat. I wouldn't let them just survive on on forage uh, alone either, because you don't know uh, what deficiencies you're going to be causing. Unless you have a lot of bugs out there, uh, I don't think your your colony should be able to survive or should be uh, subject to your experiment. So providing adequate chicken feed, I think it's important. This is a recommendation. You know, we, again, I'm in Florida, you're somewhere else. So uh, you may not have the amount of uh, moisture and pests as, as we do here. Um, but the recommendation is to store your feed on a tightly uh, sealed uh, container. Uh, plastic is it's, it's something that can can uh, break down with sunlight, uh, with freezing and thawing of the environment, with uh, you know the use. So a tin or an aluminum uh, can or storage would probably be best. Um, to keep rodents away, to keep, uh, you know, the moisture out as well. Feed early in the morning and uh, early in the evening before before the sun sets. Uh, so that way you you measure that these animals are, are feeding uh, just the amount that they need and anything else can be taken away. That way... You're not spending a lot of money on feed or to feed, you know, mice or squirrels or whatever. And when you bring rodents into the coop, you're also bringing disease. So you don't want that either. So a lot of uh, the housing, uh, you know, opportunity that we have in the United States are uh, they're growing, I guess, the, the housing options. Uh, I've seen horror stories on how people keep chickens, um, but if you buy something off of the internet or uh, a box store, they usually have uh, a recommended amount of animals um, that you can house, um, and you should be thinking about that space. Uh, floor space is important. Run space is important as well. You have that animal that that's got enough space to stretch and 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 run. That'll be awesome. That's what they need. That's what their nature is to roam around and scratch and and be a chicken. Okay. Uh, protection from the weather. Um, you don't want to have just a tarp in your backyard if the weather's gonna be uh, below freezing. Uh, I know that the uh, egg that that. Uh, Chicken can stand temperatures below freezing without stressing out. Um, eight degrees Fahrenheit, I think it's the 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 uh, when they start stressing. But I'm not. I'm from Florida, so I don't have that problem. So uh, you gotta go and figure that out that one out with your local extension agent. If there's gonna be a an extreme weather event, they have to be protected. Um. Also, protection from predators. Uh, everything is one thing to eat your animals. We've had hawks here this fall that have been an issue. Uh, flying predators are a big deal uh, around the fall in Florida because they migrate down here. Um, 
and we got to deal with them. We have to protect those animals in order for them to survive and to be productive. They have to be uh, stress-free. What I have is an electric fence, and I also have a cover over my coop here. Nest boxes uh, for layers. Uh, the recommendation in Florida is going to be one nest box for every eight uh, layers. And they usually take turns, you know, every morning you have you have a line of, of, of hens that are that are waiting patiently for the for for their peers to use the nest box. That's that's pretty cool to see. So these are your enemies, okay? These are the guys that usually you protect your animals from, and you may have other animals where you live that are going to be different predators, but your neighbors or the people that are roaming uh, around your neighborhood are gonna be usually uh, an issue, especially if you have uh, picked a fight with your neighbor, uh, they're gonna be the ones that are going to have uh, the most power over or your animals sometimes, and they're, they're gonna call the uh, authorities on you if you didn't plan right. So think about that. What uh, can we do to protect them and to do things right from the get-go? So um, when you talk about low density, uh, it, this, this is gonna be variable depending on where you are. These are the numbers for uh, for Florida. And again, we have we have to deal with heat stress. Um, so uh, as well, we have animals that are that are going to uh, have to deal with uh, weather events. We have a lot of rain, especially in the summertime. So we want to have uh, recommendations that are that are according to uh, your specific location. That's why I'm going to stress it again. Call your extension agent, look at your university, local universities uh, uh, recommendations. Um, they're going to give you better information than what I can give you because my information is going to be specifically for Florida. Dry feet are extremely important. When chickens go to the bathroom, they, they uh, are going to start... Uh, excreting moisture through your, through their feces and that moisture can accumulate and uh, start decomposing and create odors that are going to be uh, detrimental to the animals and to you as well. So having an absorbent uh, flooring with uh, some shavings that can take all, the, all of that moisture for the time being and then adding some more, it's extremely important. Um, Structure, uh, if you do not have a coating of paint um, in your coop and that moisture is just uh, uh, penetrating the wood of that chicken coop, that is going to have a detrimental effect over the uh, structure. So think about these things uh, as you are planning. You don't want to have uh, enough space for everybody to roost because this is a natural behavior of the chickens. Uh, so in Florida, the recommendation is to provide six inches of perch per bird. So that way they have enough space to huddle together. Or if it's uh, it's a, a hot night to stretch out and uh, let the air flow between the animals. Try to put the roosts in opposite sides from the nest boxes so you can keep the eggs and that space clean. So when you harvest the eggs the next morning, they're not full of uh, yesterday's food or poop. So there's a lot of creative ways to make feeders out of uh, uh, stuff that you can find out there. We can go with wood, we can go with uh, some of these plastic totes. Uh, but the idea is to have enough space for animals to uh, reach the food that you're providing. So three linear inches per bird. It's uh, the recommended amount of space. I'm, an, I'm, I'm talking about chickens here. Uh, it may be different for other types of birds. Um, so our chickens are happy and they're not trying to... Uh, 
defend or survive uh, when you're feeding. There may be an animal that's going to be uh, the alpha animal that is not uh, that'll eat everything and not let the weaker uh, birds eat after after them. So think about uh, planning for for growth as well. This is a classic uh, Florida chicken coop here, uh, which is a permanent structure. And uh, this one's got a, an outside run and an inside run. I like this design because that inside run is covered. So if if there's a, a, a rainy event, the animals can go in. There's people that put uh, doors that are solar powered and uh, they have sensors. So at night, the door is going to, to lock and uh, it's going to open back up the next day um on you know with with this timer so that that way uh the predators stay out and um and the chickens stay uh you know protected so this may be something that you want um a timer would do it um and some engineering uh i like this design as well because the chicken coop uh has the space for the nest boxes and roosting space that is safe um you don't have to go this fancy this is going to cost you about five thousand dollars for uh about 10 hens but um this design is very you know wide and spacious which is what your birds need uh so that was a permanent structure this is a mobile coop a chicken tractor they were uh very popular uh several years ago the idea was that the animals were going to eat faster and uh, have uh, better uh, colored eggs and more quality and stuff like that. Um, you have to manage this intensively. You have to rotate these animals. You have to mow before you put the animals in 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 this you know the next parcel, at least in Florida, of course. And then you have to take care of the electric fencing. Um, electric fencing comes with a ground rod that you stick on the ground and uh, that helps uh, with the electric conductivity. So there's a lot more to uh, the chicken tractor idea than, than you know what was previously advertised. It is still a good idea because you're not just relying on the chickens dispersing their manure in one spot. You can rotate them around the farm and then they can help fertilize some of the pasture, but they can also destroy some of the pasture if they're in, a, in one space for too long. So uh, agriculture is an art, and uh, that's what we're dealing with. Uh, we want to reduce the soil erosion, and we want to maximize the nutri nutrient dispersal. Uh, at the same time, we want to keep the chickens uh, safe. So uh, human... Uh, hands need to be a little bit more diligent usually than with just a permanent crew. If this is your backyard uh, venture, there's different options. Uh, I had my wife uh, gift me, this is, good, this is recording, so uh, I'm gonna, gonna shoot myself in the foot here, but several years ago, my wife uh, gifted me uh, the chicken coop that's uh, uh, the wooden one that's uh, got the label of $280. In the label or in the marketing, it said that it could hold six six hens, but it could barely hold three. And uh, it was way too expensive for the material that, that it was made out of. It was cheap wood. Um, it held for a couple months and then started breaking up. And it didn't hold six chickens. So, you know, there were some limitations there. The good gesture, you know, went a long ways. And I still love her. I'm still with her. So um, this was not the the issue, uh, a major issue for me. But it, it was not worth the money that she paid for, for, that, uh, for that chicken coop. You can go with that. Or you can go with a $629 chicken coop uh, in the center there. Or you can build your own. I was calculating this earlier. And uh, this is that uh, pasture poultry uh, 
coop that you see a lot um uh that was used uh, you know several years ago in florida because of the moisture and uh and uh you know the temperature this scoop uh, wouldn't probably work but it works in in some other areas but you can build your own coop for you know this one i calculated 170 dollars so you know cheaper is better if you build it so your labor has a cost your ingenuity has a cost as well so you know try to try to think outside of the box i have a design here this this one right here that is from the university of kentucky i love this design i built several of them pretty sturdy you can hold a bunch of birds in there and it's cheap and I'm kind of cheap myself, so I, I, you know, we we work. And this is probably you can build this one. Um, I want to say that it holds, you know, ten or twelve animals, uh, pretty comfortably, and uh, you can build it for two hundred and fifty bucks easily. And my and I didn't calculate the amount of money that I would that what I would spend building this one, but um, the. Uh, the uh, web address is right there on your screen or you can ask us uh, uh, to give you the uh, documents so you you know it's got a building material list that you can that you can um, go and source your materials and and estimate how much money you're gonna spend on it this is the uh, other options or other ideas I like this first one that is in a community garden where you have a chicken coop on top of your garden bed. So you are using your, your hens to fertilize and scratch uh, the season before you're planting uh, this, uh, this plot with vegetables or flowers. Remember that chickens uh, or fresh manure can carry uh, diseases and microorganisms. So um, this has to be let uh, compost or cure uh, for some time before you start planting and, and, and using this garden spot. But the idea, it's, you know, it's pretty solid on, you know, uh, from an extension standpoint, it, it makes sense. Um, a lot of people use this hoop pens uh, with PVC and uh, with uh, uh, woven wire as an alternative. Uh, I took I took this idea to Puerto Rico uh, several years ago, and instead of using uh, using wood, a lot of the chicken farmers started using PVC, and uh, you know they don't have any predators uh, down there, major predators. So you know it worked for them. I wouldn't I wouldn't do it here, but it worked for them. Or you can actually source some of this electrical uh, PVC uh, to do you know, the hoops, and that way you're saving some money on, on wood and uh, and the hog panels. These are arcs. Um, and arcs are, are pretty cool, but you're going to require a partner or some wheels to uh, kind of move it around. These are just some of the ideas of features that you want to have. You want to have a sliding door. So if predators go uh, get into the run, uh, uh, at least you don't have a way for them to open that door. So uh, that's why that sliding door, I, I think it's a, it's a good idea to have. Nest boxes, you don't have to go crazy with, uh, you know, the purchase of, you know, uh, commercial nest boxes. You can go to your uh, hardware store, get some five gallon drums and uh, build your own. You know, instead of wasting 200 bucks, you can waste 20. And you can uh, tip your extension agent for this idea as well. Support your local 4-H club. The idea is to have the spacing that the animals need, which is going to be uh, 8 by 12 or 12 by 12 uh, inches. Uh, so the animal will fit uh, snugly and, uh, and can lay eggs comfortably. So your eggs, uh, switching to egg production, uh, your your eggs are going to start coming uh, or your layers are going to start laying eggs uh, between 16 and 24 weeks of age, depending on the breed, depending on how you uh, 
uh, you fed them, depending on the line, it depends on a lot of environmental and genetic factors that, that um, make them mature at a later or earlier stage. Um, based on the care that you give them up front is going to be when they are going to start laying uh, your eggs that influenced by their genetic makeup, of course. They're gonna have a peak production uh, several weeks later. Um, and uh, from there, they're going to start laying uh, at a later date. Um, they're they're gonna they're they're gonna be uh, daylight sensitive sensitive as you know horses and goats and sheep are. So they are going to be influenced by the amount of day light or day length or light exposure hours of light. So you can manipulate them as well. And right now we are in a short uh, day length uh, cycle of the year. So what happens is that they will, uh, birds will stop laying eggs in the winter time uh, to gear up for spring. So some of the hens, that you may have at home uh, may not be laying right now if you're not supplementing them with uh, external sources of light uh, besides sunlight. And a lot of the issues that, that I deal with with homeowners are going to be related to this specific topic. So when you have a, when you have a hen uh, that you're suspecting that she's not laying, um, you can actually look at her combs and then you can look at her abdominal capacity. And the way that you measure that uh, is with your fingers as I'm doing with uh, in this video. Um, I'm looking at the uh, capacity of the vo the volume of the uh, space between the the bones in the back of in the receiving end of the hand. OK, you you want to look at their cloaca as well. That cloaca needs to be uh, moist and, and, and wide. That means that she's recently laid an egg. So she's productive. And uh, once they stop laying eggs, the, uh, the abdomen is going to start shrinking. So that's why you measure like I did in that video uh, clip uh, with my fingers. So you got three fingers by three. That's her abdominal capacity there. And I, I'm measuring the pliability of that area as well. If it's hard, if it's bony, uh, that means that she's not probably laying an egg. And if her abdominal capacity is small, that, that's another clue. In uh, white leghorns, uh, which are this uh, poster child, you know, the, 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 the typical breed for the white eggs, um, there's pigment accumul accumulation in the legs that tells you that she's not laying uh, eggs. If you look at their at their faces, the combs and wattles in these two pictures, there's gonna be one that's gonna be pale and the wattles are going to be small uh, uh, and the comb is gonna be pale as well versus the one uh, on the left side, which is bright red. Her eyes are alert. That looks like a like a hen that is laying versus the one that's pale looks like one that is not. So those are some of the of the you know signals uh, that they are productive. Okay, I went through that. So let's look at the undercarriage. Okay, so this is how they how they poop your breakfast here. They have a an immensely big amount of of eggs that they're born with that are going to develop uh, after, you know, they mature. Um, so um, we have to look at the influence of our feed. If you're feeding too much fat, then there's going to be accumulation of fat here. But basically, the egg is going to be the yolk, which is a the the folliculum is going to have the, the germinal disc and the yolk fused together and then it's going to go through the reproductive tract and then you're going to have the white the white that is it's it's secreted there and then the shell is going to be secreted there 
uh, when she poops that egg or when she lays that egg, that egg's not had any contact with air yet. Uh, so it's going to be uh, semi-malleable. So, you know, it's, it's semi-soft. When it dries up, then, you know, it, 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 it becomes hard. Inside the egg, there's different uh, structure there. Um, of course, you have the germinal disc that I talked about earlier. The yolk, you have the white, and uh, and uh, in a in a whole egg, you're gonna have an air cell. That air cell is going to uh, help the 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 chick uh, survive when she when when it is uh, getting ready to. Uh, to hatch out and that's where the chick uh exchanges air with with the environment that air cell um the the, the shell is not um impermeable that's why you know they survive it has tiny little holes um where the egg can exchange uh, uh gases with the environment those same holes when you're harvesting the eggs you got to be careful not to soak them and 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 put contaminants in inside the uh, those little holes so that's why um the advice is just to uh wash the eggs before you're cooking with them um instead of just dipping them and washing them uh, so you're probably forcing some bacteria inside um the egg there's different uh solutions for wiping eggs you can try that as well um but the idea is to uh be mindful of the way that we treat eggs especially when we are trying to sell them we want to sell quality instead of uh a bad egg that'll uh that'll decay pretty quickly you want to have a a fresh egg that'll that'll uh that'll be more um uh, satisfying to the customer or you know to our family or whatever so this is a a a couple eggs here there's a fresh egg and there's a an egg that is pretty uh is getting old um the one on the on the left side has got a brighter yolk but that doesn't have anything to do with freshness it just has uh to do with uh the diet of the animal if you look at the compactness or or the uh, the way that that egg stands broken out, it, it's it's compact. It doesn't flow uh, through the whole plate like the one on the right. That is a fresh egg, and if you haven't had a fresh egg, then uh, you should sue your parents. Oh, no, I'm just kidding. Oh, sorry, I'm I'm sarcastic like that, but um when uh we expose the eggs to uh you know time and uh bad situations then you know the egg starts the protein on the egg starts breaking down like anything else so we want to have that that concept of a fresh egg in your mind so you know what you're getting uh and you know how to treat them and this is what you want so molting happens um in all birds that uh, they have to kind of renew themselves. They have to take care of the old feathers and uh, lay new feathers. So that makes them more appealing to the uh, opposite sex on the, so they can reproduce basically. Uh, molting usually helps out with temperature regulation as well. You have uh, new uh, feathers that are that are that are not broken out uh, that can trap air you have those feathers that are that are that are old that are shed and um, um, you know this is a process that takes a lot of en energy away from the birds but we can reduce the amount of molting and the frequency of molting I, I, I should say by supplementing the light when they molt they stop laying eggs when they stop laying eggs we start paying for uh uh for eggs in the supermarket and then we're not getting rid of the chickens so they are getting a free ride for those months that they're they're going to be in molt so we don't want that we want to get the best bang for our buck so we supplement in the in the shorter days starting in september we start supplementing um 
uh, that light. Uh, and that way they get up to 16 hours of day length uh, throughout the year. Um, and they don't go to molting as quickly um, for us. I, again, I'm sharing information from, from Florida. Uh, egg handling is something very cultural and I, I have to respect the way that you uh, choose to handle your eggs. Um, some people like to have them outside. Uh, some people like to have them refrigerated. Uh, whatever your preferences are, that's fine with me. Uh, anatomy tells me that the pointy side of the egg should be uh, placed down so that air cell or the, 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 the air sac is pointing up. That way gravity is not placing a, a um, it's, not, it's not messing with, with the quality, the integrity of my egg. Uh, so if you store them uh, with the pointy side down, the eggs tend to last you uh, a little bit longer. It's all about, you know, preference. You know, you do with your eggs what you want to. I'm just saying what I, what I do, okay? Based out of logic. Um, if you are, um, if you have dirty eggs, um, you're not, you can wash them again when you're using them so you're not uh, contaminating their insides. Uh, unless you're going to sell them, then you have to have an, a, a, an egg wax uh, wash solution. Um, in Florida, there are legislation, there are laws that uh, make it very uh, uh, difficult to make uh, ends meet with a an egg uh, venture here by selling eggs uh, as a backyard or a small farmer. Um, so you're limited to the amount of eggs that you can sell amount uh, and the the way that you present them. Uh, so I would encourage you to look at the laws in your state or country uh, to see what they are. Again, we have extension in the United States and Canada. Uh, that is not the same thing in, in other countries. So uh, we can help you there further. If there's some some questions on, 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 on the business marketing side of it. Um, but at least in Florida, these laws make it very difficult for people to make, people to make a profit uh, from eggs uh, based on the amount of animals that they can have per acre, based on the uh, way that you have to sell the eggs. Um, it is, it is uh, a little bit challenging. So the last thing I wanna talk about is calling. Calling is when you get rid of the animals that are not productive. Um, so that's why I was, uh, I look at age of the animal. I look at the productiveness or tendency to, to molt of these animals. And then, and then I make a decision if that animal is worth keeping or not. Uh, yeah, Debbie's got a name and I've seen her from day one when she hatched from, a, from an egg in the incubator and she's got a special place on my heart. But she can also um, be uh, a strain on my budget. If you have 30 Debbies, it's even worse. So think about getting rid of those animals that are not productive. Um, maybe that special place in your heart can migrate to your stomach. So, you know, and you have her for dinner and you can cherish her for the rest of your life um, with pictures. But uh, if you're looking at uh, sound decision making, maybe that Debbie uh, has passed her productive life and should be treated with dignity. Uh, and one way that you can you can treat her would be, you know, for her intended purpose. Uh, chickens are livestock. They are not saying there, there shouldn't be pets. Uh, we treat them as pets because they are pretty cool, but um, they, you know, this is my perception uh, that they are, they should be treated as livestock. Uh, I offended anybody. I apologize. That's, you know, that's, that is the reality. Um, so in conclusion, um, chickens have a special place in, in the small farm or in the backyard if 
the rules allow us to have uh, them. Um, a lot of times we are trying to uh, avoid paying for eggs in the supermarket by purchasing our own chickens. And when you balance that equation out, it doesn't work. Um, just think about that. Do not Google the information uh, because or YouTube the information because what applies to my environment here in Florida is totally different from where Jackie is or for, uh, from uh, where you guys are in other states or countries. So think about uh, the local information um, and common sense as well. In Florida, this is a an advice that I give my 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 clients. It's start small and remain small, because chickens are like uh, the Pringles. What is it? Lay's some uh, potato chip that you cannot just have one. Uh, they are addictive. So you know, my 4-H agent started with uh, five or six hens, and uh, there's like you know 15 right now, and uh, they're, you know, it's extra work for them. Invest in uh, planning. So you're providing them with a safe environment, with a a a friendly, a, a chicken friendly environment. I'm uh, I'm thinking about ethical treatment of these animals. They are not a dog. They're not a child. They are a bird. And that bird has several needs that that are specific to that species. So we have to uh, plan to take care of that bird as it was created as a bird, not as something else. Even though in our minds we tend to humanize uh, our our uh, possessions, chickens are birds. They are livestock, and I have to emphasize that. Um, if you have more questions, if you want to start planning, if you have uh, uh, committed some of these um, sins against poultry and you want to correct them, you can contact your local extension agent. Um, I know that eExtension has a lot more information on our local university systems have extension documents that are specific to uh, the state or territory where, where you are at. So I encourage you to talk to your local person. And again, stay sane, don't go chicken crazy. Um, and the last thing, I have a couple of uh, blogs in Spanish and English uh, at the state level that we created for you know some of these backyard issues. You're welcome to Google my name and uh, UFI as extension and blogs. And then you can you can you know look at you know what we have. We have also created a class of uh, uh, you know uh, backyard poultry production in Spanish for for the urban uh, uh, audience as well. I'm done, Jackie. Ah, very nice. Uh, we had a few questions or comments mostly uh, that came in. Pam Watson is with us. She's another um, poultry agent. Um, she commented that your dog or your neighbor's dog is also another predator you have to watch out for. Yes. Um, and sometimes the cat as well. Mm -hmm. Um Something like Stall Dry, which is a brand name product, can be used. It's like cat litter for livestock, so it comes in larger bags at a better price. Uh, I put the link in for the um, the Hoop House publication, as well as our extension.org site and our website. Hope added another one for the Hoop House. I did add a publication on evaluating fast production hens. It's targeted towards 4-H, but it's the same material. Yeah. Um, we had somebody from Bur uh, Burkina Faso who said very nice presentation. Um, he appreciated the fundamentals again. Uh, and then somebody asked, do you have any recommended resources for an egg bound hen? Yes, 
Um, a lot of people use warm baths. Um, you put the animal in in a bath with a you know with warm water and start massaging the cloaca, and that usually helps. Epsom salt and you know uh, you know all that stuff can also be used. I don't, if you use Epsom salt in your feet, I wouldn't put it in in my chicken's cloaca. Um, but you know, uh, I've heard about that too. You you basically you have to re-moisturize that area and ma massage it. A lot of it depends on why it is egg bound in the yeah. first place. And um, we did a webinar a few months ago on reproductive issues uh, in chickens. And we did talk about egg binding and preventing it. So um, how you feed the birds is mm -hmm. extremely important to prevent it. Um, and then I mentioned they should also wash the eggs in water that is hotter than the eggs and it must be running water. Don't soak dirty eggs or you will get mm -hmm. um, all that stuff yeah. in there. Pam also mentioned that when her freezer is full, she takes her extra cockerels and spent hens to poultry auctions, uh, swap meat type things. Um, with the idea that they'll eat them. Um, if you are buying chickens, I don't recommend buying them from auctions unless you plan to eat them. Mm -hmm. um, and then Pam says, thank you, entertaining and educational. Your blog in Spanish is timely. And this uh, presentation will be repeated on Thursday in Spanish. Mm -hmm. um, thank you to us for the prime chicken info, uh, eye ring and pigment leaving the hen. So that's good. And then is there a type form of structure that works better for your area? Um, and were you talking about housing? In, in Florida, um... A lot of people use the uh, a permanent structure. Um, the hoop pen, I, I like the hoop pen because it's very uh, sturdy and also it helps with the wind. Um, a lot of the, per the prefabricated structures, uh, they would need to be anchored, but the hoop pen doesn't require that. So, you know, just because of the Quonset hut um, construction. Well, our hoop houses will fly in bad weather bad wind you sometimes you have to just put something a over strap, to, yeah. to tie it down um but that was the answer that i think uh joe walter i don't know if you know him he's also in florida yes he's also a poultry guy and uh i this is for egg bound and he said ob loop can also be useful for um egg bound chickens mm -hmm. not sure what ob lube is but... Obstet obstetric lube obstetric lubes okay and you can go to the adult section in the in cvs and buy the jelly and oh, okay it's, you know something else uh do you know about calculated poor number of eggs poor is very interesting about egg quality i don't think anybody really calculates the number of pores there are what, 10,000 or something? Um, nobody knows. Um, especially wondering for poor number methods. I don't know of any, do you? I don't. No. Uh, and I think um, I think that's yeah, right. uh, we we did run a little over, so um, thank you for coming. As I said, this um, webinar is recorded. It should be online uh, late tonight or early tomorrow. Um, it will be put up on our um, our regular website. Um, the link it will be on where that you went to to register for the whoops wrong one wrong link 
um, to register for the webinar. Um, why are you doing that? Um, and uh, the Facebook page. Uh, and if you have, you can always uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel and um, get the answer there. Um, we've got some thank yous. Uh, no, we do not do certificates for the webinar, sorry. <clears throat> um, I think that's it. So uh, hopefully uh, we'll see you next month. Um, what is next month? Let me look. It is understanding the chicken breeds, varieties, and strains. Uh, the speaker will be somebody who is um, a breeder of chickens. He's also an agent at the uh, Nebraska Cooperative Extension Service. So thank you all for coming. And uh, hopefully I will see you next week. Thank you. See you on Thursday. See you Thursday. Thanks, Cope. Let me stop the recording. Yeah. Um, would you be able to send me your slides so I can look at them ahead of time?